welcome everybody and welcome to those um, members online. It's quite difficult for me to see who you all are, um, but um, you're very welcome. I go to um, item one on the agenda. Actually, I will allow Alison just to take um, a couple of seconds to get herself seated and organised. Uh, meanwhile, I will remind you, if you wish to speak, could you please put the microphone on? Um, and uh, thank you very much. There's a couple of members um, just joining. For those of you on screen, there are a couple more members that are just um, getting themselves sorted. Could you please make sure your phones are on silent? Thank you. <clears throat> Oh, there's Michelle. <laughs> um, for those of you online, um, if I could just say that we have a present councillor, Debbie Andre, um, cabinet member for children's and uh, children's services and education. Uh, we have councillor Michael Lilly, who is our uh, mental health champion for the um, Isle of Wight Council, mental health. I represent the voluntary, and Isle also, Wight, okay. the Isle of Wight voluntary sector. Uh, it, representing the Isle of Wight voluntary sector, we have Councillor Ian Stevens, who is um, Deputy Leader um, and in charge of, um, amongst other things, um, safety and community um, protection. Uh, we have Councillor Shirley Smart here, who, who I believe is representing IWELC. Lovely, thank you very much. Nice to see you, Shirley. Uh, Councillor Carl Love, who's Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Housing Needs. It's a good job I've got new glasses and I can read this. Uh, Councillor, I'm uh, sorry, Jill Kennett, um, who's representing Health Watch. Very, very important. Um, and then we've got Simon Bryant, Member of Director of Public Health. We've got Amanda Gregory, who's Strategic Manager for Regulatory and Community Safety Services. Um, and we've got Alison Smith, Isle of Wight Clinical Commissioning Group, as well as Marie, our fantastic clerk, um, myself, Laura P.C. Wilcox, and um, John Metcalf, Chief Exec. So those are the people present um, in the room at this moment in time. We were expecting Jim Pegler, I think is is his name, the new superintendent, but not um, he's not materialised at this moment. OK, so now everybody is settled. Could I please move to item one of the agenda, which is to confirm as true record the minutes of the meeting held on the 28th of October. Is there anyone that can, uh, Councillor Debbie Andre um, proposed and seconded by Councillor Michael Lilly? No, no, a point of order. Right. I just want to say that uh, in the minutes it refers to Ride East and Ride North East. Uh, since May last year, they don't exist, right, as a reference of wards. The actual ward now, or well, the two, they were merged in, into, into two wards, one Ride South East, which exists, and Ride Apley and Elmfield. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Did you want to come in, Councillor Stevens? OK, thank you very much. We um, we will have those amended, um, but apart from that, everyone else is in agreement. They're a true record. Thank you very much. OK, um, item number two on the agenda is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations? None in the room. Are there any on screen? I've got shakes of the heads from um, from those that I can see. So, um, and I can, oh, hang on, is that somebody? No, no. <laughs> okay, so there are no declarations of interest, thank you. Item number three on the agenda is um, public question time. Um, uh, we've not received any public questions. Councillor Brodie comes in on the member question time, does he? Oh, it's a public question, sorry, my mistake. Councillor Brody, do you want to come in and ask your question? Yes, I do. Yes, and it is a public question because I'm not actually a member of the Isle of Wight Health and Wellbeing Board, thankfully. It is now six months since I first asked my question of the Health and Wellbeing Board as to what they would do to seriously address the continuing unwanted position of the Pan and Barton area in Newport at the top of the Isle of Wight's deprivation tables. 
This has been the case for all of the 25 plus years that I have been involved in the local community, 17 as the local councillor. It seemed to me that this board was just a talking shop that achieved little, if anything. That was certainly my experience when I was a board member representing town community and parish councils. Back at the July 21 meeting, I was asked by you, leader of the Alloway Council, to put my suggestions for Baron Barton in writing. I did this on the 1st of August with copies to your three cabinet colleagues on this board. By the time of the October board meeting, I had had no definitive response, which I drew to your attention again. Since then, I have continued to remind you and your colleagues by email and at monthly cabinet meetings of my suggestions. As of today, I have still had no definitive response. Can you or anyone else there tell me precisely what is the point of the Health and Wellbeing Board if it cannot begin to detail and then address the very real deprivation issues that exist for many residents within Pan and Barn? Um, I'm going to bring in Councillor. Sorry? Sorry? Sorry, Jeff, I thought you'd finished the question. No, I haven't. That's typical of this council. Absolutely typical. You just want to move on quickly from this real issue. Can I continue? If you if you have your question, can, um, can I... Simon Bryan is prepared to answer. What is the point of, the, of me asking a question if you're just going to interrupt and not actually listen to what I'm saying? You're an absolute disgrace. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, uh, have you finished? Forget it. Forget it. Would, You're an you, would you like to continue to answer, ask your question, Jeff? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Simon, could we please read um, part of that, uh, your answer and your response, please, uh, for the, in case there are public, and there certainly is press that would like to um, uh, probably hear the answer. Thank you. Many thanks, Leader. Uh, we've got a full response, which we will send uh, back uh, in detail. I think what we, as a board, we understand that tackling variations in health outcomes is really challenging. It's challenging across the island. Um, and it's challenging for, <clears throat> for people living in those places classes as deprived. And we know that when people improve their health and their outcomes, they tend to move around. So um, it's about working with the place and we're doing an awful lot of work on that. There's a number of programmes that are related to both the Pan area and the island as a whole, which will impact uh, on improving outcomes. And this board has taken tackling health inequalities as a priority for the strategy going forward. So I think what we can say as a board, we recognise this. We've always thought about it, but we've really explicitly said it in this strategy going forward. Uh, Leader, if I can just highlight a couple of bits uh, that's probably worth mentioning. We've got a really strong programme of regeneration uh, led by the Isle of Wight Council. Uh, as part of that, we've got the Shaping Newport programme, which has secured um, funding to progress those priorities and the Pan and Barton part of the um, of Newport are part of that. So that's really positive. The island has been nominated to do to establish a population health management program um, as part of um, developing its understanding of the uh, integrated care partnership locally. Um, and uh, that will really help us to understand the health needs and what we need to do to tackle it, supported by the central and west PCNs, which include the Pan Estate. And a lot of work going on there around social prescribing, health and wellbeing coaches, access to mental wellbeing support, etc. Lots of things in that space. Uh, with regard to homelessness, we've got a, an assessment hub um, and we've got Howard House located in that area. So we're working across with colleagues uh, to tackle health inequalities for those who are homeless, thinking about substance use, mental health, etc. We're also working with the um, outcomes homes to ensure we have um, solutions for people who may need uh, extra support for their housing. And we've also got um, a tenancy academy, so we are providing households with the knowledge they need to secure secure tenancies. Finally, uh, we are also doing work to improve the health of the population and working with adult social care. And again, we have an early uh, help and living well service for adults that's going to start, and Barton and Pan are focused on that, 
and our 0 to 19 health listing services work out of the Newport Family Centre. And that's on top of all the work that we do with schools and education in that area that will focus on that. So I focus on a few areas there, but I think that shows we are taking it seriously. Thank you so much. Um, and this is only our third meeting, I think, certainly as me chairing, it's, it's our third meeting. Um, Councillor Debbie Andre, you wish to come in um, to mention. Thank you, Leader. If I can just add to that, um, as Simon has said, it's a whole island approach. But as Councillor Brodie is well aware, there are specific projects that are going on within PAN. I'd like to um, draw his attention, everyone's attention, to uh, a couple of particular uh, activities that went on over the Christmas period. As part of the grant funding that we received for Connect for Communities, the holiday activities and food programme actually ran at Barton School, which is on that site. And I visited personally and spent a day there seeing the wonderful work that was going on. And the, the part of that programme, it's not just what happens on the day, it's actually picking up those issues further to actually provide support for families. I also visited uh, one of the family centres that is commissioned by the Isle of Wight Council to, um, to Bernardo's, actually also based on, on uh, Downside Community Centre, where I actually personally delivered some items that would go out to help um, our families and young carers. So, and as Councillor Brodie is well aware, we have a meeting in the diary scheduled for this Friday morning, bringing partners together from our adult community learning team to actually look at expanding our adult community offer within the Downside Community Centre, specifically targeting those skills which will help the residents of PAN to come into employment in those areas which are much needed on the island. And as we're all aware, one of those is adult social care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it proves that we are committed uh, to making positive changes. And I would um, let people know that there is um, an amazing uh, group up at PAN called uh, No Limits Space for You that um, I visited when I went up to, to the area. Uh, amazing mental health champions and um, good people. I'm going to bring in Councillor Lilly, then Councillor Carlove. I just wanted to, to add, Chair, that um, obviously you know, we have a priority of... Uh, poverty and deprivation. One of the things I think is important, especially now we've got new wards, is to, to have up-to-date data for those wards and also to look at the issue of deprivation. I totally accept that PAN uh, has, you know, uh, real issues and, and deprivation and poverty. But there are other areas in, on the Isle of Wight that also, and in fact, there is at least two, two wards uh, in Ride that have that level. So we do need to actually get all the up-to-date information and actually have some fairness uh, regarding um, the, the deprivation and poverty and any initiatives uh, on, on that. And I think it's important that... Uh, we, we, we have that. And also, I think we need to have a clear view of our priorities and themes so that we're engaging with parish and town councils and the voluntary sector. And I'm saying this as, as a representative, in this case, of the voluntary sector, that can really engage uh, well with those priority themes. And I believe a previous meeting I've been at, those were poverty and deprivation. They were young people. They were mental health, and they were housing. And that was the key. And <clears throat> and health uh, equalities was sort of broadly the umbrella of those. And the, uh, the particular thing of parity. And we need the parity of services in all the areas and the hotspots of places of poverty. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carlow. Thank you, Chair. 
um, the member represents his community very well, and I just wish that um, all other uh, councillors across the island would represent their communities so vigorously um, in in addressing the issues. Um, so, I mean, we've been in office now for um, eight months, and in that time, I think we've actually done a significant amount to address poverty and the causes of poverty carrying on from previous administrations. Um, but we are in a, um, a, a period of declining budgets and it's important that we do make sure that we target our resources as best we can. You know, we are just about to um, uh, issue the Living Well and Early Help contract um, and that will be coming out. We've been reshaping that. We have our mental health champion here, as uh, has been um, highlighted uh, by uh, Councillor Lilly, um, who we've actually added some resources to so that he can be able to uh, address some of those causes. Um, we um, have a scrutiny committee, which does very much all those to account in terms of um, delivering change. Um, and change, it will only come very slowly. Um, I'm afraid, unless, of course, the member can um, identify to me some significant amounts of money where we can invest, um, which I'd be, uh, 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 I'd be, you know, willing to listen to. But I mean, but we've got all kinds of other issues across the island, dental health and so on, that we're all trying to address, and we have to balance that off against need and other county need. But we do hear what you're saying, uh, uh, Councillor Brodie, and 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 we will try our best to support you but we do have to represent that right across the island. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to move on. There's no further public questions, and I think we've certainly gone over our 15-minute allocation. Um, there's Chairman's update. Um, John, I think you were going to give a brief update on a couple of issues. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I think there's probably only three things really to uh, bring to the attention of the, uh, the board. Uh, and I think in the context of the previous conversation as well, it's perhaps worth reminding ourselves that this board is a strategic board. We need to set the strategy for what we're trying to do to improve the overall health and well-being of the island's whole population. But we have to look to our partners to operation, operationalise some of those uh, activities and turn them into things that happen on the ground, whether it's police, fire, local authority, health, we've all got that joint responsibility to, to take that strategy and operationalise it in our own areas. And I think that's an important point and certainly something we'll come on to later on in the agenda. Um, I think three points I wanted to cover. Firstly, um, just to, in case members of the board haven't picked it up, we've, we've previously talked about um, the development of the Hampshire and Alloway integrated care system, which was meant to come into play from April 2022. Um, that's been delayed now until July 2022, um, primarily because the Health and Care Bill hasn't yet made its way through Parliament, and it's the Health and Care Bill that um, uh, closes down the CCGs and empowers the uh, integrated care systems to take on board the responsibility of uh, both CCGs and the providers. So something that we're aware of and uh, uh, we are working with, and we're still talking to ICS colleagues. There is a a chairman designate of the ICS and the chief executive designate of the ICS and we're working very closely with them about what that then means for the island in terms of a locally managed approach, a local system uh, for managing and bringing those services together. However, what I think has come out of some of those conversations, which is really important and Simon alluded to it, is uh, with the support of the ICS, we've, we've secured, um, uh, we've, we've, we've put the, for the island forward as a pilot for some work around population health management uh, and population well-being um, that is promoted and supported by the ICS. So hopefully there'll be a project that kicks off in the next couple of months, uh, which is about looking at how we can, uh, as a system, as a health and care system, and bringing all the other partners in around housing and re regeneration and everything else, how we can work better to address some of the issues that Councillor Lilly's just been referring to and Councillor Love in terms of poverty and deprivation, those other issues. So we're a pilot project uh, with the support of the ICS and whatever comes out of our pilot project will be used to uh, inform the ICS's decisions about how it sets up other local local delivery systems across the Hampshire and Alloway footprint. So I think that's a really good feather in our caps and I know Simon and Alison particularly have been working very hard on securing that for on our behalf. 
And then I think finally, the only thing to mention really just, uh, and it, I'm sure it'll come up further on in the, in the conversation is that there are some changes to the COVID rules today uh, that we've seen um, mostly around face masks and not being compulsory to wear face masks in shops and in various other places. Um, I, I'm quite heartened, I think, that to see that lots of shops are still saying, you know, please think carefully, think responsibly, uh, carry on wearing face masks where you think you should. And um, certainly something that, that I'll carry on doing. But I guess that's something that, that we'll all want to reflect on and our own personal responsibility as we uh, as we still negotiate our way out of, uh, hopefully, out of the pandemic. Chairman, I think they were the three points I wanted to make. Thank you. That's superb. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for John? No. OK, so we move on to item five on the agenda, which, oh, sorry, I didn't look on the screen, so if there was no, there's no one. OK, so uh, move on to item five on the agenda, which is the COVID-19 update. Is that you, Simon? Thank you. It is, Lee, I'll be very quick, uh, but I think what we can say is we've seen uh, recently the Omicron wave that has hit our country. The Isle of Wight actually was um, managed much better. The rates didn't go as high as other parts. We were looking to see if we were following that pattern. Uh, but the rates are coming down, which is really positive in all ages. However, that's not the case in every age. So the 0 to 9 age groups, we're still seeing a rise in cases. There's some logical reasons for that. One is these children are at school. Secondly, they are the only group that isn't ever have a vaccine at this point in time. And so therefore, the virus goes to where it's easy. The good news is that children aren't seriously ill with COVID. Uh, so, yes, they're getting uh, unwell mainly mild symptoms, sore throats, but they're not getting seriously ill uh, with very few hospital admissions. Some of the hospital admissions are because in children it's quite hard to distinguish what a young child has, so precautionally they go to hospital, but in the main they are very, very, uh, doing very well. So in that sense, we have, we've moved forwards. Uh, we need to keep an eye on that. I suspect as we ease up on plan B, uh, we'll slightly see a little uptick again, as we always do, but then moving forward, we are monitoring that. And listening to the kind of senior colleagues nationally, I think this is the way it will go uh, unless there is another variant. And obviously I can't predict that, but we monitor them, look for them, and then we'll be back into working with the national government to see what's in place. So I'm really pleased the way it's going. There's an awful lot of work to do uh, to carry on, as uh, Chief Executive said, some of the good measures. And also, as others said, and we'll talk about it in a minute with the COVID impact assessment, the impact that the COVID restrictions and COVID had on our population. Really happy to take questions, Laura. Um, are there any questions? Mm, nope, nobody on the screen. Hello. Are, are you Jim? Oh, oh right. Hello, Adam. Hi. Uh, hi. We don't have a name badge for you. I'm so sorry. Um, OK, there are no questions on the COVID update for Simon. Um, so we move on, actually, to item number six, which is the Ireland COVID-19 um, recovery plan. I understand this is Chris Ashman. Yeah. Chris? Good morning, leader. Can you hear me? Yes, you do sound. Um, yeah, just just speak up quite clearly because um, Councillor Brody did sound like a Dalek. I was only getting every other sort of word. I don't know whether you could hear him better on screen, but certainly here it sounded a bit like a Dalek. Um, so if you could speak clearly, Chris, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, the board will re recall the um, uh, requirement for the Health and Wellbeing Board to maintain an oversight on key issues connected with COVID recovery. Uh, as we all know, it's been a slight uh, stop-start approach to uh, the recovery agenda, given the resurgence of the Omicron variant. And I think it's worth knowing, noting, before I give a brief update on the, the points on the slide on your screen, uh, that obviously we, we just re-entered another grants process uh, in terms of supporting businesses that have been affected by the, the Omicron process. So we're hopeful, obviously, that as many businesses will take advantage of that grant support um, and enable us to come forward out of recovery with um, as many businesses as we have intact. We're anxiously waiting on the uh, latest st statistics regarding business failure, uh, and we're hopeful that um, 
we'll see a significant benefit to the speed of grant payments that we made over the last 18 months in retaining as many businesses as possible. That being said, this board um, is taking a keen interest in the points on the slide uh, in terms of the overall oversight for the COVID recovery plan. The COVID recovery cell, which comprises all of the different partners on the board, uh, meets on a regular basis to consider key actions and extra over responses over a business as usual that we need to take to respond to these points. So clearly members um, on the board will be familiar with the, the housing needs issue uh, as being a top priority for the council's corporate plan uh, and specific initiatives within colleagues in our adult social care division, as well as in my regeneration team to actually address that housing needs agenda, both in the short and medium term. Uh, and very much at the top priority for the local authority. We've heard already this morning the focus on anti-poverty as part of recovery and the disproportionate impact that the, pa the pandemic will have had on some of those communities. And John obviously referenced the pilot for the Integrated Care Partnership, which we, we welcome. The uh, Lord Lieutenant is also leading on the uh, concept of a, an invitation from the National Lottery for the uh, for the island to potentially provide a strategic response to uh, structural issues affecting the island to to the lottery itself, and I think it'll be important for the health and wellbeing board uh, to inform that um, that discussion. Um, given that it will need to be a very much a partnership based approach to to any lottery invitation, I think colleagues from education will obviously report um, uh, good progress in terms of the attendance uh, rates at schools. And obviously we, we will watch carefully the use and take up of the catch up funding the government has provided uh, via our education services, both in Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. In mental wellbeing, we've got the mental wellbeing strategy, which obviously will be you know, properly resourced and implemented. Um, and we see specific opportunities such as the uh, loneliness, uh, addressing loneliness through transport project, which, um, which our colleagues in highways will preparing in partnership with others uh, a, a strategic application to address that particular issue. Um, no progress really on the commemoration and celebration uh, agenda. I know obviously within the council itself, we, we continue to want to highlight and recognise the achievements um, both together and in partnership um, that the island has made. Uh, and I think there is uh, further work to do, uh, which will obviously update the board on as it progresses. The implementation of Kickstart and other apprenticeship programmes continue um, and obviously we work with our partner organisations to try and identify uh, with DWP uh, an ongoing route of um, potential opportunities within the public sector to uh, provide training, particularly for young people. I think the good thing, uh, the encouraging thing on the statistics front to note is that the unemployment rate isn't um, uh, as, as badly affected as was feared. Uh, and that the island, whilst above the uh, southeast average, uh, is 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 doing well in terms of um, um, measuring and uh, identifying where those priorities need to be. And last but not least, leader, uh, we continue to work with the, a section of the business community in developing a, a, an island place marketing approach and the idea for a new um, island website to actually demonstrate what a special and attractive place the island is not just to invest, but also to live and work uh, based on our principles of the biosphere. So I'll, I'll stop there, leader, and take any um, any questions um, and obviously um, any other updates from partners on the board regarding recovery. Thank you. Important issues there raised um, and important priorities too. We need to keep a check on those. Um, there's a couple of hands up in the room, so I will go with Councillor Debbie Andre, then Councillor Michael Lilly. Thank you, Leader. Um, Chris Ashman, you, you mentioned about the attendance rates, and I'd just like to thank um, the island community because our attendance rates are actually higher than the average, than the national average, which I think is, is testament to all of our professionals working in education. I do have a question. You mentioned about catch up funding. Is this something that will come through the Regeneration Directorate? or will it be applied for through our um, education? I, I think it's a, a specific support that's available to individual schools, councillor, uh, and obviously our colleagues in uh, in education will be advising the, 
the various uh, head teachers regarding um, the usage and access to that, ensuring there's a, a sharing of good practice and uh, access, for example, to uh, online tutor support. I, I know Steve will be able to come in on that point. Just can I say, just bring in? Can I bring in Steve Crocker because he's got his hand up, Steve? Yes, Chris is correct. It is director schools. They can apply for funding for things like um, uh, extra um, tuition for individual pupils, etc. But it doesn't come through the local authority. Okay, um, I'm going to bring in Councillor Love. I'm uh, sorry, Councillor Lily, then Councillor Love. Chair, um, just in in two parts. Um, I would like the opportunity as a mental health champion to make an announcement today because actually we've got some really good news that's of, of a fund that's being launched today. So I'd like to come back to that because that particularly tackles the issue of mental well-being. And I think it's relevant for this committee note to know what is happening and, and my feedback from the listening to it. In relation to this report, um, I suppose I want to heighten the fact that, uh, particularly under the section of Mental Wellbeing Vulnerability Index on 24-25, specific areas are actually mentioned. And Absolutely, it, you're, you've skipped on to um, item seven on the sorry, agenda. I, sorry, that's sorry, item seven. Sorry, the assessment, sorry. Yeah, you're on the assessment. We're on the COVID recovery plan, item six at oh, the okay. moment. So shall okay. I bring you, I'll bring you in for item seven. Uh, <laughs> OK, my second then question in relation to, to that. One of the things that particularly has happened through, COVID, the, through the COVID period and very much part of the plan has been the mobilisation of uh, the, all the hubs and particularly uh, in town and parish councils and a number of, of parish councils are much more heavily involved in health and welfare than they have been, right? Um, and it's quite interesting that you've now got a kind of consortium of those areas actually coming to, to, together with the voluntary sector. So compared to, to before COVID, you have a much more organised voluntary sector and town and parent council network that are also putting their own funds and precepts in that uh, Rye Town Council is making its precept next week, is putting further substantial funds into community development, into health development, uh, you know, uh, and social welfare. And I think that there has to be a much closer working of public health and the CCG and the um, NHS Trust at that grassroots level. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Love and then Councillor Ian Stevens. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I've got two quick points and questions, perhaps. Um, I was wondering whether if um, uh, Mr Ashman would be able to say a little bit more about his efforts in recruitment and retention, because we've got you know, a, a massive shortage um, for our health colleagues as well as ourselves. Um, within adult social care and, of course, uh, right across the island in, in other places as well. I think it's really important that we put a lot of effort into this because we do need a workforce to be able to do the caring that is necessary in all elements. And so I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about what, what you're doing now, but what you intend to do. It's really important that we look forward to see, seeing the step now is this, but what we need to do collectively is this. And I think it's really important that we look at that as a plan. My own other uh, little bit was actually crossing into Council Stevenson's area, which I'm sure it, it will. Oh, yeah, it will. Well, I, I just think that housing is actually, you know, in causes of poverty. It's it's a massive issue, and it's something that this administration uh, is is taking really seriously. And and it's a very difficult position that we inherited in that there's been no house building for a significant period of time on the island of any significance anyway in terms of the type of housing that we need for our residents from rented accommodation and affordable 
um, and I think that that has to be a priority as we move forward. So those are two issues which I think that this administration and believe that this administration will put a lot of emphasis into. The problem is without a workforce to build those houses, <laughs> which is another issue, okay, and that is why I believe that that is a significant area that we need to focus on because the government can give us whatever targets it wants. If we do not have a workforce to be able to deliver, then we end up in crisis. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Could you switch your microphone off? Councillor Ian Stevens. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I um, looked at the list and I noted that housing was at the top of the list. I would have preferred it to be housing stroke homelessness because that's the situation we're in. Uh, we haven't peaked yet, I don't think. We're still, you know, people are saying, no, it's plateaued out a bit. No, we've still got a situation with regard to housing, uh, homelessness numbers. We've still got uh, a problem with, as Councillor Love pointed out, with housing not being built. I don't go along with affordable housing because affordable housing be, can be under so many different guises. I go along whether you're going to rent or, uh, or purchase. Now, that, that's the thing and how we can help people um, purchase their, their own homes. That's one element that we really need to look into. But I think the, very, the variation uh, between rented and purchased and other forms of tenure, because I feel that, you know, once again, South Build and, and if you like, um, uh, you know, a 50-50 or a percentage uh, put up by the uh, local authority or indeed housing, uh, uh, housing partners, is another way forward. But the big thing about this and the, and the problem, and I take on board, everyone knows, everyone knows the problem, everyone knows that we have not built enough houses. And with the, um, with the situation with regard to materials alone, it's going to be a struggle to, uh, to get things on track. But mental health and other um, elements and pressures on on uh, on um, families and individuals uh, is one of the things that if you haven't got your own front door, if you haven't got your own um, area where, which you can call your own, and whatever it may be, then the pressures of everyday life become increasingly difficult, and that and that that impacts on all services. And when we start to talk about OK margins, it's not going to be profitable to build a, a three or four houses here or five or six houses there. As a local as a local authority, we should say, hold on, because if we don't build those and if we don't put families and individuals even into into various uh, accommodation, then it impacts on our social care, our education, our health licensing and everyday life on this island is impacted now that's the price if we don't if we don't continue down the route that you and i um leader have gone down if we don't continue and we don't get things <coughs> moving quicker than we're, we're the, the, the supposed forecast then we then we are going to be um in deep trouble as we as we go through this year, especially especially when uh, the uh, Airbnbs and and others open up and they put more people out of accommodation. We've got to be ready for it. It's great to have uh, you know to to start to look at modular um, homes and things like that that we can we can build. But we've already said we've already said. That that's a, not an overnight fix, and thank goodness we've got we've got an empty properties officer who gets out there and works wonders, along with along with other staff, because that's what we've got to go for is, is probably the um, ready-made fix, and that's and I'm going to leave it there. But that is, it's happening at the worst time with the COVID recovery. 
there's going to be uh, have the brakes half on right the way through if we don't start to get our housing uh, situation under control and move it forward. And as I say, don't worry about the or do worry about the margins of the of, of the build and how much it costs, etc. But worry also about the margins that you could add in from uh, uh, the NHS, the CCG, uh, social care, mental health, and education, etc. It's it pushes it into a very, very, very big equation, bigger than bigger than when you just talk about housing and homelessness. Look at look at the ramifications uh, to other services, and uh, with that leader, I didn't need to be told to. I was going, but emphasis on the homelessness and housing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. I'm not going to bring in Councillor Lilly. Um, uh, Chris, um, I know there was a question there, I think, from uh, Councillor Love. Uh, if, you, if you can remember the, what that question was um, and can answer, that would be great. Um, I agree with Councillor Stevens. Um, I understand within the past uh, year, the empty homes officers brought back into use 74 homes, which is um, pretty remarkable considering we have very little teeth um, and which we, uh, you know, in which to force um, issues there. So um, that's a superb job. So, uh, Chris, if you could um, answer those questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, leader and, and members make in, entirely the right point in terms of the, the impacts the pandemic have had on what were pre-pandemic significant issues already. So the uh, the pathway, taking Council Love's point, the pathway of entry into social care has always been a challenging one um, and the need to actually access uh, a workforce that is younger and that is is able to support the, um, the commission network in terms of achieving their objectives was a pre-pandemic issue. It's been exacerbated by the impact of the pandemic. So I, I think I can try and obviously reassure the board in relation to the adoption by the council um, in November of the Isle of Wight Skills Plan and a very specific focus within that around some of those key sectoral challenges. And the core element of that is improving the relationship, particularly between our schools and the, and the labour market in terms of identifying how opportunities for career work pathways such as social care on the island are available to young people. I, I, I have to say, and both Laura and I were, were disappointed that when we ran short courses back in the uh, the summer, unfortunately, the response from the, the general unemployment register wasn't as encouraging as we'd hoped. And I think we'll need to do more of that to actually run those customised opportunities. But there's very clear sectoral need within that skills plan, it, a relationship in terms of developing a, a better communication of the career opportunities with the um, uh, with the post-16 sector in particular. Um, and obviously that will form an important part of uh, the regeneration and the uh, and the education approach that we take forward into the coming recovery years. I think the final point really on Councillor Stevens' um, reference to the housing matters, I think in the context of what this board is there to achieve uh, in terms of the collaboration on health and well-being, I think you, the board will hopefully be encouraged to hear that uh, the different partners collaborate regularly on the One Public Estate programme. And a really core asp aspect of that is to bring forward housing on public land on the island. Um, and there is a very clear uh, set of opportunities currently supported by the Brownfield Land Release Fund opportunity. Though that funding would not be available unless we had a collaboration between the trust, between the CCG, between the police and the fire service, looking at land across the piece. And um, I just wanted to reference the work of that um, that one public estate partnership uh, to the board. And obviously we can provide separate updates and reports on the progress with that. One final point, I did have an update on uh, actual house completions in 2021 right across the market uh, and there were actually 400 houses built in 2021 um, and obviously we're all aware through the housing members board of the um, of the 200 affordable houses that were, were built in that period um, and much more work still to do as Councillor Stevens rightly highlights um, but the RSAP project in terms of providing that homelessness move on um, again property acquisitions using government funding in the in the mix as well. So hopefully address some of the points that members are very dear leader. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. And um, that was accelerated by the 75 homes um, that Southern Housing Group did as the extra care facility, which um, is 
you know, truly needed. They've looked at the demographics of the Isle of Wight um, and they've acted on that. So uh, very good. I'm going to bring in councillor uh, who wants to come in. Uh, Michael Lilly wants to come back in. Is it a question, please? Question. Uh, is it uh, possible to have data uh, of the current housing situation post COVID? For instance, we know the rented, private rented market went incredibly down. We obviously know the price of property has gone up about 50 percent in, in places like Rhine. It would just be good if we've actually this committee have got data to actually know exactly what this particular issue is. All right. Thank you. Yeah, it will be in the QPR reports that come through in um, two weeks time in the cabinet papers housing. Um, Councillor Debbie Andre. Thank you, Leader. Is Chris Ashman aware that the advisory, uh, the Adult Community Learning Advisory Board met yesterday? The skills plan was actually on our agenda. We had partners there, including a representative, the strategic manager for the Isle of Wight College. And one of the action points coming out of that is that we are going to be working closely with partners exactly on this issue to actually link up with our our schools, our workforce, and those opportunities that will actually feed into those gaps in our island jobs market. One of the other things that we have pledged to do as well is to actually draw up a timetable of all the events that go on, for example, uh, National Volunteers Week, that actually feed into that so that we will be working in partnership and collaboratively on those, on those um, events. Thank you. I can see that Chris is um, agreeing that yes, he is aware of all of that. And the more that we can get out to the public about this, the better. Uh, Councillor Love, you wanted to come back with a question? Yes, thank you. I mean, it, it's vital that we all work together on this because the workforce is acute. The workforce crisis, uh, bleh, start again. The workforce crisis is acute across all elements. And I'm aware that some of our care homes are going out to the international market. It's rather disappointing that we haven't been able to engage many of those people who are unemployed, because we have a significant number of people unemployed on the island who need to engage with training. We need to investigate the causes of that in, in detail to try and get them back into the workforce. Um, and I'm aware that there'll be an impact for, you know, Police and Crime Commission and so on. Um, but it would be interesting to hear what the NHS are also, uh, and CQC are doing uh, to address the, the, the critical work shortage. Because without workers, we are at the precipice now of falling off the cliff because we do not have enough workers to deliver what is necessary. And we are seeing a slow decline. I'm not telling you anything that's not in the public. We are seeing a slow decline and loss of our care homes. They are closing and reducing the numbers of beds and we still have to care for people. So workforce is absolutely critical. And what we can talk about it lots. What we really need to see is the collective action plan to specifically address the workforce issues. That's what we need, the very specifics. So I'm kind of criticising myself, really. I need to stop talking about it and start delivering a workforce regeneration. And that only comes from working with our colleagues in the NHS and CCG and others, because it's not just about this, to address the housing, etc. It's critical and we must address that. And we must continue, as I know that, that uh, 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 Mr Metcalf is doing, to press government for that all important element without which we can do nothing or very little, and that is an island deal and settlement. We need that critically now so that we can resource what it is that we need to do. Thank you. Sorry, I'm a bit of statement clear. Sorry. Right. Would you like to switch your microphone off, please? Um, Laura, um, you've got your hand up to speak. Um, thank you, Leader. I just wanted to follow on from Councillor Love's comments in relation to that critical workforce piece and to hopefully provide some assurance to the Health and Wellbeing Board that that is something that the Integrated Care Partnership are very focused on. We've got an active workforce cell of the partnership who routinely are looking at all options in relation to those workforce pieces. Um, Chris Ashman mentioned the 
access to care course that we attempted to run with the college. I'm delighted to let you know that that's running again um, the week after next and we have had some uptake on this occasion and I think it may be useful for the Health and Wellbeing Board if at a future meeting we ask colleagues from that workforce group to present to you some of the activity that's being undertaken across the health and social care system to support with recruitment and retention of what is a, a very valuable workforce for us as an island. That's a good point, Laura. Thank you. And I think that would be very useful. Thank you for that. Um, is there any other? Oh, Jill, sorry. Um, just a, a quick comment, really. Um, what we've noticed in the West White is we've been very impacted by second home buying during the COVID time. And we have liaised with Cornwall, actually, and um, spoken particularly to Mevagissi Parish Council, where they have managed to bring in a housing project. Um, because like we're finding it on the island, we've, we're losing all of our workforce because they can't afford to live in some of the areas now. And they're bringing in policies about homes that are built specifically for people working within the area. Um, and and they have stipulations on them that if those people want to sell, they have to sell at the same right to somebody working in that in the in the area. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of um, similarity between Cornwall and the island actually around this. And I just wondered if there were any schemes like that being thought of on the island. On um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I have been also in touch with Cornwall um, because, of course, there was a lot of uh, made of, uh, of their second time homes and the similarities between us. My understanding is it's down to each town and parish council in their parish plans um, to put something in. As you said, it's, it's that small area. It's not Cornwall as a whole, as in the whole authority that have put this on. It's the town and parishes that are taking actions in their areas. Are Councillor Smart? Thank you, um, Madam Chairman. Um, I won't take long. Com going back to homelessness, when we're looking at the data that um, someone's going to prepare, um, I'd, I'd like to know more again about our homeless figures, et cetera, on the island, where they are, and so that's the areas that we can really get buckled down, because as you know, I have been involved in homelessness for rather a long time. Uh, our homeless register, I think, at the, at the moment sits at around the 2,000 mark of people that are on the homeless register. It's around about that. Um, it, it generally creeps up to around 4,000. You, you have a sweep of different things, and it, but it, stay, it does stay roughly. What I would say it has definitely impacted with the amount of people, like um, Councillor Ke Jill Kennett said, um, that, you know, that have come, that, that have moved here and second time home owners. We know that that's an issue. We know there's around, you know, 2,000 something um, second, um, second homes on the island, or it, it could even be a bigger number than that. So we've got, we have got the stats and it probably would be useful to bring um, some of those pertinent um, stats to this board because you do really need to see the situation um, and see you know and see the the, the struggle that we've got to provide home yeah. homes yeah. it really is it, it's yeah. a, a real situation yeah I was oh I'm sorry I've got still got this thing on um, but I was really thinking of the statutory homelessness etc which of course in some cases um, is more desperate than in fact the people on the housing list because people on housing lists are kind of different but i know you want to carry on so i i'll I, I think it's 20 families that are that are desperately um in need of permanent homes des you know that are on say um band one of the uh, one of band one so that's gone up uh, that has increased uh, i'd like to move on did you really want to say something very quick I was just going to recommend that uh, you, you kind of beat me to it, that we actually bring a paper to the next board meeting of, of the available statistics on, on where that is, um, not yeah. obviously the individuals, so that, but, but more importantly, some recommendations of specifically what we can do in those areas to try and address that all collectively. You know, a paper telling us statistics is helpful, but it doesn't tell us how we're going to address it. We need the real specifics of we've got 50 and we're going to try to do this with the support of, of parish councils. 
Okay, um, I'm going to move on because um, we've got a heck of a lot and we've only got half an hour now. Um, so, uh, Chris, there's nothing you wanted to come back with, is there? Chris Ashman? No, thank you, Leader. Okay, that's great. So, I'm going to move on to item number seven, which is the um, joint um, JSNA. Yeah, so it's a long old, the joint impact executive or well, summary strategic needs assessment. Um, so, that's Simon again. Uh, thanks, Ida. And just to remind paper. people that this is about health and well-being, and we need to kind of make the board uh, and our priorities for the strat strategy are housing and health, and the health bit is key for this board. Other people doing the housing bit, uh, inequalities, uh, and mental health and well-being. Uh, what we've got uh, here is a joint street needs assessment, which is the responsibility of all members of the board. Uh, this is the first part of a suite of documents coming through. As people say, we need to understand where we are. So I'm going to present a very high level summary. You've got much more information in your pack. Hopefully Marie's going to do the magic with the um, presentation. Uh, and going forward from here, we've got, uh, and I've presented the plan before, thinking about healthy people, healthy environments and healthy places. And we'll bring that forward to the board and have a workshop with members of the board and key other uh, officers and members of our organisations to really dig down on the island to make sure we understand what our priorities are. Uh, sorry, Maria, you have to do the click through. Um, I'm going to be very quick, uh, but this is our strategic context. We want to know our demographics. Um, it's really focusing on the COVID-19 and the impact that the first two waves had on the health of our population. That's really important, um, but we need to kind of move that forward. Think about, as I said, healthy people, healthy lives and healthy places. And we're going to go through some care as a focus. So the uh, going through uh, there, we know that the, if you click through to slide four, that's it. Uh, the, the table on the right, and it's in your pack, really shows the difference in different um, policies over the time of the pandemic. Um, and that has had an impact on, as we talked about, employment on people who's going to school. And that's been really important to understand. Um, and then, Marie, the next slide, I think the diagram in the middle, it's small, but it really shows the impacts of the wider determinants of health, health behaviours, the psychosocial impacts and the physiological impacts. And if we can focus on those factors, we can really start to make a difference to health and well-being, which is what we're about. Um, going forward, two more slides, so we've got demographics. I think it's really important to know that before the pandemic, our health was not improving. Uh, across, we're not unique across the country, but actually we know that our health was uh, in a downward trajectory. So that means people are living longer in poorer health, which then impacts on their health care, on our ability to uh, live the lives we want to. And I realised I presented some of this at the ICP yesterday, but not everyone was there. Um, and we've got an older population that is ageing fast and we've got less ethnic diverse, but that is growing and we need to think about that. So when you look at um, how healthy people are on the next slide, Marie, you can see those graphs on that downward trend by deprivation, as we've all talked about, a really important factor for us to understand in, to improve the health of our population and life expectancy has decreased. So then moving on to healthy people, so the, the next section in the pack, um, oh sorry, I've, uh, if you click through Marie, uh, to section four, there we go. Uh, who's been impacted by the uh, population from COVID, we know that in the first two waves, over 60s was a strong predictor for poor outcomes and the older people were disproportionately affected. We saw that in a variety of settings. However, younger people, and we've called those age 70 and below, are more likely to experience long COVID, particularly women. So actually, what do we want to do to try and change that? What do we really need to think about in the way we change our approach to health and care and well-being going forward? And Often, and I say very carefully, the females in a family are the carers, often, not always, and I'm not making gender stereotypes, and just that's what the data shows us. Um, and then moving forward, uh, you can see uh, in the next slide that um, whilst there were more females having higher number of cases, males were sicker with COVID. So actually, what does that mean for the kind of ongoing things? So it's an interesting kind of dynamic there that could be about health service use where males often go to health services later than females. Lots of oftens and carefully wording it. So moving forward, what we've got in this pack 
is a number of maps, and they're all there, uh, which show different wards and different areas that are impacted differently from different factors of our population. So we can see here uh, from ethnic diverse population, we know that they were um, harder hit by COVID for various reasons, and we can see where they are on our population. I'm going through fairly fast to kind of have time for questions. Um, and then we've got a slide here, the next one, I'll keep going, sorry, I must have sent Marie the full pack. Um, older people, we can, these people have been impacted differently, these age groups. So what do we want to do um, as, an, as organisations together and our individual organisations? Really, the JSNA is helping us ask questions so we can dig down and understand what we want to do. It's the strategic document. Councillor Lee will be, uh, have read this bit in detail, but we can see, looking at our mental, vulnerable mental well-being index that we have designed locally on a number of factors that have been um, carefully considered where the populations with more vulnerable for mental well-being are living on the island. And that's really helpful to think about how we work um, across to tackle that. Moving through, we know um, lifestyles um, have been impacted on our uh, by COVID and we know those people with long-term conditions are likely to be more impacted. So how do we think about protecting them? Thinking about not just COVID, but flu vaccinations and other things. We know these people may need some more support to take that up and uh, understand how we can protect them from other things other than COVID. And we know in the next slide, lifestyles have been affected. We know that diet has been affected and uh, some people have uh, eaten more junk foods. You can see that physical activity levels were definitely impacted and we've seen a dip in that. Really important working with Energize Me for our physical activity strategy. Uh, and there's other factors there. So how are we going to think about those factors when we work with the clients that we work with uh, in the settings that we work with? And again, the next slide shows a map of that. Oh, flicks. that slide shows a map of where we have identified greater health vulnerabilities uh, with Jill here, you know, West White. You know, there's lots of things there. How do we focus that and work with our local situ situation? Uh, then, if you skip on two slides, place, we can see that place has been impacted for different reasons. Um, and this is around um, so the variation of infection across different pa parts of the island. Um, Laura at Godin well know, uh, you know, with care homes in different parts, that has impacted um, on people living in those places. Uh, I won't, uh, uh, if you go through to slide 24, kind of after care as a focus, there's a number of things around businesses that Chris Ashman is much more closely. But how do we think about those care as focus? The underlying health risks from COVID aren't just for COVID, they're for other things as well. Thinking about our people who are more disproportionately affected, and we can bring much more information through around this. So older people, minority ethnic groups, uh, and other people who are living in uh, challenged circumstances. Uh, and then finally, we, as I mentioned, people of uh, women of a working age have been disproportionately affected by the uh, long COVID, but probably also by being the main caregiver, trying to do homeschooling. And then uh, Steve Crocker and uh, Councillor Andre very aware, disrupted education, we had to do it for a COVID reason, but actually it disrupted education and people's young, young people's health and well-being. And I know we're seeing the impacts of that now. So how do we um, move forward? So, uh, Laura, that's the presentation. I'm going to suggest that we have a workshop with not as part of a board outside of this, bringing key officers together from all our organisations to really develop this data and our understanding going forward, which could bring back a report to the next board. I agree. Absolutely. Such important issues on there um, and some really good up to date statistics. I think that's really needed. Um, Councillor Lily. I um, just want to actually report back, Chair, to link to, to this report that since September last year, I have been going out uh, as a mental health champion with Health Watch. Uh, and um, public health as well, uh, right around the island. Um, and I've been sort of visiting communi geographic communities, but also communities of interest, like the LGBT community, um, the veterans, um, etc. Um, I've had meetings regarding young people, 
school children uh, as, uh, as, as well as um, adults. And I think one of the, 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 fun, the, the things is that so th from a qualitative point of view is people on the, on the ground are deeply affected by COVID. It is affecting their mental well-being and how they see life and how they um, uh, it's weakened their resilience and uh, their concepts of uh, what they see their future and opportunities. Uh, but what we've also seen is at grassroots level, a lot of self-help has actually been occurring. Um, a good example is veterans, where you now have a wonderful veteran shop on Ride High Street that is packed, that is linking in all the different agencies, and they even have a, a van or bus that goes around uh, to actually stop in villages to, to, so veterans can have a cup of tea and, 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 and side. It's quite an quite initiative. Um, and people want their voice heard. That's the thing. They want to be part of the recovery. They want their voices to be uh, that. With this, I can announce today, and it's going to be in the press, of press releases going out, uh, in collaboration with Councillor Love and Public Health and um, myself as the champion uh, and, and Isla White Health Watch, we uh, found 50,000, or uh, Councillor Love and Simon Bryant found, found 50,000 within the public health budget, and we are launching a small grants fund to really go to grassroots and support uh, the, um, the voluntary sector and uh, the community, uh, community groups to, to be able to develop projects to actually enable a network right across the island, which hopefully will uh, enable people to get the peer support that they need. There is wonderful projects like uh, called uh, Men Only, there's some, some brilliant projects within the, within the LGBT community, the veterans. I spent a fantastic time with Ventnet Anxiety Cafe. Uh, I recommend, the, um, Chair, that you actually visit uh, them because there were 30 people having a community meal that actually um, said that if they didn't have that place, then actually they would be taking their own lives. That was a very, very you know strong message. They needed that access point. Uh, Freshwater, the, the community centre, there's another example. Obviously, pan together. We need these safe places. And there is an initiative that was developed through COVID uh, with, I think, uh, with grant money that came through um, Ottawa Council that was to develop a network of safe places. There are 40 already. I'm going to be recommending as the champion that, um, that we have more of these right across the island. These are places, they might be a local pub, they, they, they might be a shop, they might be a community centre, but they are places where people go who know they, they will get empathy, not to be judged and it's been um, signposted uh, to the services they, um, then they need. So uh, we're looking for, hopefully with that funding, it might be for 500 pounds, uh, it can go up to 5,000, but we're looking for about 20, 30, 40 projects at different levels that actually start to build that uh, network of grassroots hope and I'm talking to the mental health services, Leslie Stevens, I mean, she's not here today, uh, to how we make sure that there's a pathway from when someone's feeling really down to the uh, acute service, and there's a, there's a uh, prevention at the front door, uh, but if people go into acute services, there is a pathway out. 
and I think uh, uh, we have to this I'm sure the, the Alliance has made this a priority and Council Love talked about action well I'm getting out there and I'm doing it Thank you Councillor Lily good to know um, there are no further questions I don't think from anyone um, on there so oh. oh hang on sorry Chief Exec oh right Carl sorry. oh hang on Carl Ansher Carl always has something to say, as you know, Chair, <laughs> always <laughs> keeping me silent. I'd like to thank um, uh, Mr. Bryant for his uh, report here. Um, and uh, looking through these, it, it's the challenges. Our challenges page uh, is the one that caught my eye. Um, uh, the Isle of Wight has, uh, the Isle of Wight CCG has the highest number of over 65s in England, yet they doesn't, the, sorry, yet the island doesn't have a fully integrated um, frailty um, pathway so my response to that is what can we do to work together with you to get that in place as soon as possible so that we move forward and that is you know so that's really important and I thank you for, for bringing that to us I don't know if you're able to respond to that is, is, is response to that Alison do you want to come in thank you yeah I think what you're referring to is the health and care plan um, councillor love which is where that program is going to be taken forward. <coughs> So I would say that it's already on the radar and progress is being made, but Michelle has got a hand up because she leads that program. Okay, Michelle, did you want to come in on that on that item? Thank you. I know um, we're I, going to be speaking about it um, in the next item, but if you'd like to comment, thank you. Uh, so my colleague Michelle Young will be actually speaking about it uh, on the next item. Uh, firstly, apologies for not being uh, with you face to face today, but I've tested positive for COVID. Um, so I'm working from home today. Um, um, just to say, Councillor Love, um, your comments are, are music to my ears because uh, we are so uh, determined uh, to get a frailty pathway up and running and obviously uh, we'll be needing uh, the council's support for that, making sure that all system partners are involved with that and um, our health and care plan will will refer to that. And so um, I'm quite happy um, and Michelle is as well to have some one to ones with you guys. Um, I was going to mention it today because I was planning to come uh, so we can talk about this um, offline uh, more fully and, and, and really get some momentum behind it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smart. Just the practicalities, really. Um, don't forget to actually tell people about this so that um, applications can be put in and where they can put in because um, one, one hears of these things um, and then trying to find out where you apply for it is virtually impossible. So can I just say, please let us know. Thank you. Uh, yes, there, there is uh, publicity going out and we're making sure all the information goes to the town and parish councils, is circulated through the, the, the voluntary sector. There is a programme of getting uh, you know, press releases uh, in, in, in involved, and I'm actually talking to the media whether they would do special features uh, within it. And because I've actually been out there with Health Watch, we actually have already, I suppose, encouraged a lot of application um, on uh, on the ground. But I am absolutely um, vehement to actually make sure that we get out as much as possible. We've got to the 10th of February. Uh, on on that decisions will be made very quickly after that so we can get the money out to people right. okay can i bring the chief exec in please yeah thank you chairman um, simon i wonder if i could just clarify a couple of points i think there's some really rich data in the in what you've presented and clearly the responsibility of the board is to produce the gsna but then i guess it's the responsibility of partners for to take it away and to digest it and to to make the most of it in terms of their own planning so uh, I guess two questions really. So one, how do we how do we encourage that as a health and wellbeing board? And then secondly, um, how do we make sure that we factor this into our developing strategy as we go forward and make sure that you know, we really are up to speed in these particular issues? And then and then there was a third point, if I could probably just make it while I've, while I've got the microphone on. I noticed there was, there was a huge amount of um, 
think Parkhurst flagged quite a lot for me in a lot of the draw, a lot of the diagrams. Now I guess that's partly to do with the prison, and therefore my question is, how do we make sure that we interact with colleagues at the prison so that they are part of our planning processes as well? And how do we best do that? Thank you. Uh, you're right on all those fronts. So the first one, I think, it's how we, as a board, take ownership as members and really spread it. And we are trying, we are going to work on a better. Um, a, a way of communicating the, the findings and the information. So on a more regular basis, members will get information going, this is a new data we've analysed, and yes, some of it won't be relevant for all of you, but actually it's good to share that, and we'll, we are making sure that our website access is much better um, as part of the website design, so we're doing that. Um, and I think we need to be really clear, uh, I would ask, you know, maybe as chairman's announcements, we start to, you know, feed in that and say, this is the latest bit we've developed, so people go and look at it, and develop as part of our plans, and that's why we're, uh, I'm always harping on about it in meetings. Apologies, colleagues. I think the final point about Park Coast is really well made. Uh, we, the prison is part of our population, and there are people we need to make sure improve their health. Uh, Alison will correct me, but I think health and justice may start coming down to the ICS at some point, so therefore we'll be working closely with ICS to ensure that the health provision and those prisoners who may at some point leave are having good health as well. I'm not sure what, uh, uh, so what I heard. We will uh, continue to work with um, the government of the prison and, and keep open communications. Um, I'm very keen that we, we that we keep that. So thank you. Um, OK, so we move on to item eight, which is uh, Michelle Young, which is the integrated care. What is it? Partnership health and care plan. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, Michelle um, Legg, feel free to uh, kind of like chip in at any point. Um, but what, what I would like to outline um, to the board today, hopefully you've all had sight of the pack that was circulated and, and some of the, uh, the statistics that are within that. Um, the existing health and care plan um, is due to run until April of this year. So for the last six months, we've been working with Ireland Partners to refresh that. We've been very fortunate in the fact that we have extensive data that is available to us. And yesterday at the Integrated um, Care Board, we actually had um, a discussion around how we have to align this very much to the health and wellbeing strategy. And just hearing the conversations today, that's very clear that we need to, to do that. Um, so in the pack, you'll notice there is a slide that is around sort of the alignment of the health and care plan with existing strategies on the island. And, and we're very mindful of that as we sort of like carry on developing and the plan over the next uh, couple of months. What we're also doing is going through a, a period of reviewing existing um, conversations that have happened with members of the public and we we have a not large number of partners that have been part of that process and we will be continuing to do that over the next coming week so we've got 12 to 18 months worth of um, information that is coming from island residents and that will be triangulated with the objective data uh, that we you'll see some of it within within the pack today um, Obviously, the existing health and care plan has been impacted by COVID and we, we, we know in the first year we actually delivered almost a plan, but then we obviously moved resources to the COVID response. So, yes, we accelerated some of our delivery, but other things that we would want to have delivered obviously wasn't able to take place. So that will be carried over where relevant into the new plan. So I'm going to move on to uh, what Councillor Love uh, mentioned in one of his questions was around our island demographics. And one of the, um, the, the real standout things for, for me and the people that have been working on this is, yes, we all know that we have an ageing population, but for the island to be having the highest number of over 65s compared to all other sort of CCGs, it's actually quite um, quite shocking that we don't actually currently have an integrated frailty pathway. Currently, about 12% of our population are what are classed as being moderate to severely frail. So it's something that we actually have to work together as partners to deliver. 
And we raised this yesterday um, at ICP board and we're given permission to actually really accelerate this before the launch of the, the refresh of the health and care plan. And it's something that we're really keen to do. And at this point, I want to raise the importance of prevention within that. And, you know, we, we know that the kind of public health has a huge part to play when it comes to frailty. And if I just give some of the examples around, you know, osteoporosis, for example, we need to make sure that our screening of this is actually paramount. So we're avoiding sort of any fractures further down the line. We know housing has a huge part to play and isolation. So we need to consider all of this as part of our integrated care moving forward. The, the other point which um, I found really interesting is when you look at the top 20 long term conditions that are reported, the island is actually um, an outlier from England averages on 17 of those. But what was really fascinating is when you look at the top five long term conditions where we're in the top 10 of the CCGs for those conditions, we do have conditions like asthma as part of that which is quite unusual for an island community. So we have been working really quite closely with the birth cohort study to try and understand some of the reasons for that, which will cross over into some of the aspects that Simon has already raised around health and wellbeing. So what we will be proposing going forward, and hopefully once we've been able to triangulate some of the subjective data, is work up sort of like four sort of pillars of opportunity prevention, pathways, productivity and partnerships. But what I will say with that is we know as an island what works best is when we actually pull together all of our resources and we try and avoid any of the, the silo working. Because as we've started talking about, for example, frailty, everyone recognises that we need to do something about it. But actually, we need to bring all of our resources together and tackle this as, as a one unit. So you'll notice in the pack we we've started to develop um, some of our impact statements. Now they are evolving and I think the version that was actually tabled for this meeting has already changed as we've started to have some of our informal conversations that Michelle has already um, hinted at. So what we'll be proposing is we will go to ICP board um, in February with an update as to how we would like to link with the health and wellbeing strategy and our first tabling of our in-depth pack for the health and care plan will be sort of in March with a public facing document worked up in April. So we're hoping that we will be able to then launch the health and care plan in May. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions about that or if there's anything else that Michelle would like to add. Um, just say thank you, Michelle. Um, Thank you for that presentation. Um, I would just add very quickly that we, we're working very closely um, with our, uh, particularly our public health colleagues. Uh, Simon Bryant's been involved with this. We're making sure that it's very much aligned to um, uh, active things that are happening on the island. So um, COVID yeah. um, yeah. and we're going to make sure that it's very much outcomes based. Um, but yes, no, I don't really have anything else to add because Michelle did a great job. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, quick, sorry, that was absolutely fantastic. And I'm I'm delighted that you got to the end of the presentation before we lost you. We we lost you at the, at the tiny bit. If you wish to switch your camera off so that the connection doesn't go, that would be great. Um, I'm going to ask for questions now. And I see Councillor Love is asking a question and then Councillor Lily will. Thank you, Michelle, and, and for spelling out the timelines. I think that's really important that we, that we have a very clear m movement forward. Um, are you able to share some resources with us, Michelle, is, is one of the, you know, in order, what, what resources can we bring to this? Because obviously, you know, we, money is the, is the elephant in the room, so as to say, with all of these things. And, and it's, a, it's important that we try to identify early in the plan what actual physical and financial resources we've got and what we can do to continue to press this government to give us some more money, particularly into the public health side of things, because our, our budgets are static this year. As far as we know, we haven't yet had that budget settlement, but it's a static budget. So whatever we have to find, we have to find from within. 
and um, and clearly I'm looking at, at uh, Alison here from CCG about trying to divert some funding into this. Such is the importance of this particular piece of work. Thank you. Can I just come on the back of uh, Councillor Love's point just to say, I think, you know, we all need to invest in prevention because actually the public health budget's a very small part of that. It's only £7 million. And we best invest billions and millions into healthcare. So how do we just kind of shift that focus, which is what Michelle said, and I think I absolutely agree, Councillor Love. Um, um, Councillor Michael, oh sorry, is that Michelle coming back? It yeah, is, sorry, yes, Michelle sorry. Um, I, was, um, I was just going to respond to that. So um, we had a conversation yesterday about the exact same thing. We, we have a lot that we want to work on on the island and what we're going to need to do is actually prioritise you know, where we have the biggest impact, certainly in our first year of the, the health and care plan and how that links in with the health and wellbeing strategy. There are opportunities for us to work more efficiently, um, but I do take the point that we really do need to kind of be able to invest in some of these areas to get the maximum impact. Thank you, Michelle. Sorry, it's confusing with two Michelles, isn't it? Um, it's a bit like two Laura's actually. Okay, uh, so uh, Councillor Michael Lilly. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this um, report. My question is, is about the conversation, uh, particularly with the voluntary sector. If you look at the areas of asthma, cancer, etc., stroke and dementia, if it wasn't for the voluntary sector actually providing a range of services on the, the ground, like the Prostate Cancer Society, like the Alzheimer's cafes, um, we'd be even struggling even more. So. Uh, I was asked by the voluntary sector yesterday at a meeting I had was to highlight that they would like to have more active uh, involvement and debate so their voice is, at, is around this table much stronger because they are picking the pieces up. The, I do wish to flag up an extra, an extra question about carers. If you look at this list of the five conditions, there are people who are actually caring for someone and during COVID, those carers are absolutely on their knees, right? And many of them have, have similar conditions. They're just a little bit less worse than the person they're caring for. And we really do need to look at that, and particularly carers in dementia, because our dementia services in the park, particularly the acute thing, are still not right. And we really do need to invest uh, in the area of, of making sure that we've got better dementia care on this island. Thank you. I'm going to bring in um, the other Laura, the LA Laura, not the LO Laura, uh, Laura Gordian. Thank you, Leader. Um, it's just to provide some reassurance that the refresh of the carer's strategy and the launch of the dementia strategy are both pieces of work for the first quarter of the next financial year. There's been a full public consultation around the carer's strategy and we're just about to start the task and finish groups, the focus groups and wider public engagement to ensure that that really is reflective of the needs and wants of our local population. And the dementia strategy will be coming through to the um, cabinet for formal sign off uh, before proceeding to the integrated care partnership into the health and wellbeing board in March of this year. So two great pieces of work that absolutely recognise what Councillor Lilly has just said in relation to the importance of informal carers and the need for support for people and their carers with dementia on our island. Well done, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, oh, Councillor Stevens wanted to come in. Sorry. Councillor Stevens is going to uh, withdraw his line of thought and questioning and I'll wait until we see the paper at Cabinet and possibly we'll come back to this uh, um, board and see what, uh, see what we can find. I'm very keen to make sure that all elements of uh, the Isle of Wight, both uh, Caring Support and NHS, CCG and indeed uh, the Isle of Wight Council are working together and not just coming in here talking about it. We want some informal meetings. I take great um, 
great satisfaction that we got to our commitment down there. And I see that the organisations are there. We need a couple of more organisations to link into that. But that's that's down to the um, CCG, NHS Trust and indeed the Ottawa Council to pull together and um, get out there and uh, involve others and move forward in a, informal meetings sometimes get the get the best results. Thank you. Um, um, sorry, Chief Exec, you wanted to speak. Okay, that was a previous bit of paper. He, he hasn't, uh, yeah, he hasn't crossed it off that, he, that he's come and spoke. Uh, Michelle, the thank you, both Michelles, thank you so very much um, for a, a really good, clear, and precise report. Seriously, um, and masses of work, uh, still more to be done. Um, but I think we're in very safe hands there. So thank you very much. Okay, so we're moving on to the final item, which is members' question time. Are there any questions from members present? Thank you, Councillor Debbie Andre. Thank you, Leader. It's more of a request to this board. I recently attended the AGM of an organisation, People Matter, Isle of Wight, and the chair of that organisation has requested that um, he be included in this board. Um, the uh, uh, People Matter, Isle of Wight, are the island's user-led organisation for anyone who defines themselves as having support needs and their carers. They also, they, they offer a range of services and they also um, run the PA recruitment and employment service. So I think it would be of value having them included in future on this board and I ask for that consideration. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, I've been in touch with um, with them to, to congratulate them on the fantastic newsletter that they produce because it gives out so much more so much information. I don't have an issue with um, them joining this committee, Councillor Lilly. Um, just want to actually say that as chair of the voluntary sector forum, and I'm actually standing down. There is an election at the moment for uh, the representative of the voluntary sector. Uh, to come to this board and that um, people matters are part of that forum so they could actually put themselves forward and take the place which I will be vacating. Thank you. You will be a loss, Councillor Lilly. Uh, Councillor Carlove. Yes, I've just got two quick things. Uh, I, I want to thank the voluntary sector and all of those people, the hidden, the hidden carers at home who work tirelessly and without which um, we will be in a far worse position than we are today, who've done wonderful jobs during, um, um, and thankless jobs, to be honest, during this pandemic um, for, for all of their loved ones and the people on the island. But without them, the island is very rich in its, uh, its depth of voluntary sector. But I also wanted to say thank you to the, the coroner's office um, because they've had a very difficult time in the last 18 months of working hard. And it's a very small team on the island and they have to deal with some quite horrific things. And they are a service which nobody really likes to talk about very much because, um, you know, death is not something that people easily engage sometimes. But they've done a wonderful job and I just wanted to say a big thank you to them in the background for um, dealing with things as they have. It has been testing for them at times um, because of COVID as, 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 as with everybody. But I just wanted to say thank you to them. Um, I would agree about that. Um, I know that the coroner's office has done uh, uh, more than they um, ever normally do in a year. They've managed to achieve that in pretty dire circumstances and um, pretty inadequate offices. Uh, Councillor Ian Stevens, it is your um, your area. Well, it's all been said about the coroner's office, uh, office about our bereavement services, about our licensing and, uh, you know, uh, trading standards, people that have been out working um, extremely hard. They're virtually the unsung heroes of, of uh, uh, our council and indeed our island. But what I want to get back to is the original request and question. Now, I believe, and I might, I might be pilloried for this, but I believe that um, to bring in um, organisations 
to the Health and Wellbeing Board, um, as opposed to as opposed to representative organisations such as IWOC and the voluntary sector, will be opening the gates to other other people. This this board will um, move away from strategic to a more operational um, thoughts. And I think that what we need to do is, if you if you go down that route, then you're going to you're going to change the face of face of the board. And in which case we, we would have to look at the objectives of this board. So I think, from my point of view, any any organisation out, out, outside um, needs to contact their umbrella organisation and put, and put their requests through through them, and not as an individual organisation, and possibly get the representation of that board or whatever they are, and leave it at that. Thank you. Um, thank you. And this is why you are my deputy and why we are aligned. You are quite right. What I will do is ask Councillor Lilly to speak with the, um, with the, the, with the, the man at uh, People Matters and suggest the route in through the uh, voluntary sector, because otherwise we would have to change, like you say, um, the, the constitution and how we do it. I'm going to bring in Simon uh, Bryan. Lord Gregory's had a hand up for a little while, but uh, I was just going to make a suggestion that might Okay, sorry, Laura, you come in first. It's right, the Chief Executive's not doing a very good job, uh, Laura, of telling me when people have got a hand up. He did say he would do that, and he's failed. Um, so, Laura, if you'd like to come in, and then I'll bring in um, Simon. I'm grateful to you, Leader, and far be it for me to criticise our Chief Executive in any way whatsoever. I'm sure he's doing the very best job he possibly can. Um, I'm also grateful to councillors Lily and Stevens, as I actually lowered my hand based on the representations that they both made. Um, the People Matter Isle of Wight are commissioned by the Isle of Wight Council as our user-led organisation. The work they undertake in relation to providing uh, PA services they do as a private business that isn't commissioned activity and accordingly I align completely with the views of Councillor Stevens and Lily in terms of the representation needing to come from the voluntary sector as a whole rather than as individual organisations. Thank you Simon. I say it's helpful and very happy to meet with them and have a conversation about how they link in through to the things like the JSMA so if that's a helpful offer I'm very happy to do that. What I would say is they produce such a really good, a very, you know, explanatory leaflet. We get it through as, as councillors, I presume, and it's just a good way for us to dissipate information. So thank you very much. Councillor Lilly. Just want to reiterate that there is a mechanism or mechanisms that's managed by Isle of Wight Community Action for the voluntary sector. Uh, they do have regular meetings and uh, we do integrate or integrate into um this board there is a danger that if you have certain organizations and that has happened in the past with the integrated partnership um you then um the smaller voluntary sector organizations have less of a voice because the big ones and i'm naming no one some of the, the big ones have more uh, link in and, and direct sort of voice in which is actually unfair and we have to look at procurement very carefully because some of these organizations are actually competing against each other to do that so if they have representation on boards that makes that process very unfair thank you very quickly thank you leader i'd just like to say that i was asked to make that request I've made the request. I'm very grateful to colleagues for putting things in perspective. And I think we have established a mechanism by which they can engage without necessarily being part of the board. So I'm very grateful for colleagues on that. Chief Exec. Thank you, Chairman. Just in further to Councillor Lilly's comment, I think it's very important to make it very clear this, this board does not award contracts. It doesn't no. get involved with procurement of contracts. It's about strategic no. advice no. to the organisations that work across the health and care spectrum. Uh, and in order to get their plans and activities aligned. 
Okay, um, thank you all very much for attending. Um, I apologise to Councillor Brodie that he left the meeting early, but it was very hard to hear. I, I did genuinely think that he had finished asking his question um, because he did sound like a Dalek. I'm very pleased that everybody else I could hear very coherently. Thank you very much. Thank you all for your time um, and uh, see you in three months' time, I think. Thank you. Stay well.